Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, today is uh, April 17th, Wednesday, 2013. Uh, this is a makeup class for ECE 3030, uh, spring, spring semester. And uh, this is part two, if you will, of, of a two-part series related to applications of diodes. So in part one, which is already posted on the YouTube channel, uh, I reviewed tunnel diodes and photo detectors and solar cells. And now I'm going to go to the opposite side of the spectrum and I'm going to be talking about instead of photo, photon collection uh, in a solar cell or photodiode application. Photodiodes, of course, are for uh, predominantly for light wave communication, fiber optic communication applications. Uh, I may have gotten a little um, uh, haste, uh, rushed at the end because that makeup ended up going very, very long, longer than I anticipated. Uh, so please ask me questions live, real time, in class before the final exam if you uh, have any regarding uh, photodiode and band, speed band, bandwidth power application uh, uh, trade-offs and, and stuff like that. I won't go in and require you to have any knowledge about noise. I think that's, uh, we just don't have time for that in this semester. But now I'm going to talk about the light emitters. So I'm going to be talking about light emitting diodes, and then I'm going to go into laser diodes. So this should reinforce that last computer problem, which is the 980 pump laser to pump the uh, erbium atoms. It's the 4F to 4F transition to create the excitation, which allows the photon amplification through a, uh, a uh, erbium doped fiber amplifier, EDFA. So, Let's talk about light emitting diodes first. What we're trying to do is we're trying to hit various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Predominantly LEDs are uh, for human consumption, predominantly. So we're looking for Roy, Roy G. Biv. There are some where we might want to go into the infrared and we might want to go a little bit into the ultraviolet perhaps. So, um, so light emission, there's uh, different forms that can take. So essentially for light emission, all we're doing is, oh good, I thought they were hiding the chalk, is what goes up comes back down. So if I excite and kick an a electron hole pair, and I kick this up so I have an electron hole pair, then eventually I know that the, um, uh, electron will relax back down, fall back down to the hole, and that electron hole pair, electron hole pair recombination. So when this comes back down, it will release a photon of a certain energy consistent with E2 minus E1, right? And so E2 in this case may be the conduction band, and E1 may be the valence band. Now in your quantum well laser problem, they were, uh, they were quantum confinement shifted by a certain amount, but that's nevertheless the case. So the photon energy is related to the differential in the two energies. Now how we get the carriers excited up, we can do that a few ways. We can do photoluminescence. So if I uh, excite photons up and, uh, and they're absorbed, then the other part of the model, oh, I have it right here actually from one of the previous Looks like no one erased it. If I excite a carrier up, from the valence band, now this is the band structure, so this is the E versus K diagram. If I excite a carrier uh, of a higher energy than the fundamental band gap at the gamma point, then um, the carrier will be of a larger energy, will have to be excited uh, to, to uh, uh, satisfy the requirements of the band energies, that it would go off here and excite to a higher uh, area of the conduction band, higher energy of the conduction band. Then it's going to perhaps do a thermalization by shedding phonons. So that's why we use thermalization. So um, emit phonons. 
nons. And so then it'll relax back down. This thermalization may happen in a, in a picosecond or less. Very, very fast process. So then it collects, the electron collects at the conduction band minimum. Um, and so that's coincident with this, because remember this is the band diagram, which if you remember is sort of basically like cherry picking a string out of a sweater and pulling it out. And so I'm looking, in this case, I'm only looking at a conduction band extrema. I just want to reemphasize an old point. And uh, this is the uh, valence band minimum. So what I'm showing you here is a direct band gap material. So I have no, so I have complete momentum conservation. Remember that was one of the exam questions on midterm two. Uh, so so then it thermalizes, and and so the question is, how do I get this excitation up there? I can throw it up with a high energy. I can throw the electron up there by hitting it with a higher photon energy. So maybe I hit it with blue, and then it relaxes back down and re-emits a red. So that's what this is talking about. So photoluminescence is basically the, um, the material absorbs a photon of energy greater than the, than the band gap energy, e.g., creating that electron hole pair, and then it re-emits a photon. I could do cathode luminescence. So cathode, by the name, is uh, um, uh, implies that you have electrons coming off from right, the old cathode ray tube and so forth. So these are electrons that are coming off of a cathode and hitting. So it's basically you're hitting your sample, your, your semiconductor with, a, with an electron beam. So, uh, so that can also, a high energy electron, you know, can, can be kicked up to the conduction band if it comes in with enough kinetic energy. Of course, this kinetic energy has to exceed band gap energy. So with an impinging electron beam, electrons then relax to the conduction band minima, and then eventually, you know, uh, uh, so many time constants go by, and it's eventually going to relax back down. Electroluminescence, well, that's where you're basically injecting by a PN junction. So we know if we build an interesting PN junction, we're essentially bringing in electrons from the cathode, holes from the anode, and so this is an oversimplification, but I would have a PN diode in here, and they would be meeting in the middle at the depletion region. So there would be a recombination in the depletion region, uh, so on under four bias, uh, directly injects electrons into the conduction band of the P side, which can recombine with holes and uh, emit photons. So direct band gap materials, which is kind of an old topic, but needs to be revisited in light of LEDs. An electron recombining with a hole can occur at the gamma point and conserve momentum. Radiative recombination is highly probable. Indirect band gap, of course, is an electron which re relaxes to the conduction band minimum, needs to emit or absorb a phonon to transfer to valence band minimum. So silicon X valley, for instance, to the gamma valley or so forth is how silicon is. So radiation transition, not very probable. Re recombination process usually generates heat or phonons rather than photons. Uh, luminescence, basically, when this photon comes off, which direction it goes is completely random. Completely random. So I don't know if you're, you're, you've come across this terminology before. But essentially, uh, geometrically, they refer to it as, as emitting in two pi stradients. So essentially, one pi is it going off in, in a hemisphere. So it basically is emitting in a globe around some, some imaginary point. It can go pi stradians up or pi stradians down. So it's basically the whole globe. It can go in any direction, um, and uh, so all directions. There's zero directionality. So again, three basic transitions, light goes in, excites, it sits there for a while, then it comes back down, emits a photon. Here is the idea of stimulated emission. So this is this idea that let's say I have a carrier that's been excited from, from whatever way is, is kind of up in an excited state. So it's sitting up there. 
a photon comes in that is coincident with the E2 minus E1. And um, as this goes by, basically it's like shaking a fruit tree when, it's, uh, when the fruit is ripe. And so you shake it as you go by and some of the apples or oranges fall off and you get more out than you put in. So as this thing sh uh, goes by, it shakes that electron and stimulates it to, to release, relax back down. And so one photon in, two photons out, this is in phase, this is the basis of the laser, right? It was actually, by, by historical records, it was actually the maser, a microwave amplification for stimulated emission of radiation, a maser, uh, which I think was originally developed uh, actually at uh, University of Michigan. And then the laser was uh, kind of uh, a series of different people uh, putting that together, they ended up using a piece of glass, a ruby laser, and I remember hearing a story that the guy who actually finally got credited with the patent actually was like on a holiday or so forth, had, had, had this epiphany, this big brainstorm, jotted some things down in a lab notebook, and he actually went down to the bank or the post office and had it notarized. So it actually validated that on that particular day, he had invented this particular thing. I think there was a bit of a, of a who, who got there first. And I'm not 100% positive of that story, but I thought that, that was what I heard, that eventually that person got credited. So you kind of have agonized over this on the second computer problem, where we're looking at uh, different 3-5 compounds to, to basically hit different wavelengths. So I could think of it in in energy, band gap energy, but I can convert band gap energy to microns through that one uh, conversion that I presented in the uh, second computer problem. So uh, you probably have, uh, I mean there's various ways, various ways you can combine it, but you can see this is the uh, gallium uh, indium arsenide phosphide quadrilater quadrilateral, if you will, it's kind of not quite a quad, but if you go between gallium phosphide, indium phosphide, indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, you basically are, are uh, looking in the quaternary alloy of indium, gallium, arsenide, phosphide. And so you can be any, depending upon the uh, ratio, stoichiometric ratio of indium to gallium, arsenic to phosphorus, remember it's a 3-5, so just to be explicit, that would be indium X, gallium 1 minus X, uh, arsenic Y, phosphorus 1 minus Y. So this would be the 3, and this would be the 5. So through that quaternary alloy, so this is that zinc blend crystal structure, two FCCs interposed with each other. So the one FCC are these guys, indium and gallium, the other FCC is arsenic phosphorus. So that composes so I can uh, dial in whatever lattice constant or wavelength I want. I can hit any, anywhere in that whole phase space. I can do the same thing, uh, aluminum arsenide, so aluminum, gallium, uh, and arsenide and tinamide is another kind of combination. So I can go between aluminum arsenide Oops, uh, aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, and uh, my this button's getting a little funky. I've been overusing it. Gallium antinamide and aluminum antinamide. And then I can even do all kinds of other sexy combinations. I don't even have to be restricted to those four components. I can mix and match almost anything on the three column of the periodic table with anything on the five. So you can see I can basically hit most wavelengths of interest. So... Here's another representation of that, where I can hit different uh, preferred substrates. Uh, I think this is a little bit attenuated. Let me back off and go 85%, say. I'll take a wild guess. Yeah. So here's uh, some preferred substrates, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium antitinamide. Those are probably the three most commercially readily available ones. Gallium arsenide would be the cheapest. Indium phosphide would be the second cheapest, and gallium antinamide would be the third cheapest. And actually, in that same order, this is more um, 
mechanically strong, so it's easier to manufacture. This is very, this is more, much, much uh, more brittle, and this is much more brittle. So it's actually not only is it cost go up, but its ability to be manufactured goes down. Uh, so they kind of tells you which preferred substrate you want to put on. So actually, you're looking at the smoking gun answer for the quantum well problem, because if you want to hit 980. You're probably going to be on on uh, one of these materials. Uh, actually, does this show it? You're probably going to be. Oh, that's EG. Um, uh, so you actually want to be probably around 19% indium on the indium gallium arsenide. Yeah, this unfortunately doesn't show the wavelengths over here, but 980 uh, would be about 19% between the gallium arsenide and the indium arsenide. So it'd be along this ternary tie line, maybe one of the preferred things. So you'd probably be around, guessing around here, so you'd have a small mismatch to the gallium arsenide substrate. So I just gave away the answer. Um, yes, you've seen this before. This is technically wrong. Oops. This is technically wrong. These are, as you can see, these guys do not go satisfactorily into the blue and the violet, purple. Um, the nitrides do. Uh, this data point is wrong. It actually belongs down here. Uh, it was kind of reinvestigated, and the prediction was there, but it en ends up being down there. So the gallium nitride material system, that's what allowed you, this was a hard uh, material system to, to develop, and it actually goes back to the fundamentals that we've agonized over, that I've made you agonize over, about doping. That it was very, very hard to dope these materials, so it was very, very difficult to make a PN junction. And it was um, uh, an accidental uh, discovery in the laboratory that determined why this was not being uh, able to be doped. And it turned out that they put the dopant in, but they grew it with a uh, CVD reactor. And CVD reactors often have a lot of hydrogen in them. It's the, one of the byproducts that when these precursors come in, they uh, often have like, like uh, uh, gallium would be delivered with gallium, um, uh, trimethyl gallium. So there would be methyl groups, uh, three methyl groups uh, hanging off of the gallium. So the trimethyl gallium would deliver to the surface, three methyl groups would, would peel off um, and um, pick up another hydrogen on the way and go off as methane, uh, CH4. So there's a lot of hydrogen hanging around from all these uh, um, uh, uh, methyl groups and so forth. So it turns out the hydrogen actually went in and combined with the dopant and actually neutralized it. So some guy was actually by accident did cathode, uh, 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 cathode, it was hitting a sample with an electron beam, which actually caused the hydrogen to go away. It blew it off, essentially. And then he remeasured his sample conductivity, and all of a sudden the sample was magically a high conductance. And so it was a very accidental discovery about this hydrogen passivation technique. So they've mastered that, and that's what you see now. So if you buy Christmas tree lights, uh, that are LED, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be gallium nitride. If you see, uh, you're starting to see high-end uh, Lexuses and things like that will have uh, light emitting diodes as their headlights. It's starting to become more and more prevalent. The energy efficiency is going up, the um, cost is going down, and it's, uh, it's a, the horn of the holy grails is to replace all lighting, all fluorescent lighting with LED lighting. It's actually the conversion efficiency is dramatically higher. It's just whether it's cost competitive. Uh, you'll actually already see most traffic lights already have replaced the, um, the red and the green and the, uh, and the amber have actually been replaced with LEDs in most places in the United States. Um, so let me go back to fit width. So here's the relative human eye response, right? Here's your Roy G. Biv. 
it, 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 it's basically your retina is somewhat, I have a better uh, figure for this, but it, it, um, there's a limit to how red you can go before your eye stops seeing. It's uh, the centroid of where the eye is, is about 0.55, and it attenuates at the, um, at the violet. Uh, yeah. So for instance, I think I mentioned this once before, and then we can re-emphasize it here now in the context of LEDs, is that if I make a red LED, I may use uh, a gallium arsenide, so this is gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, so this is showing you as I dilute the gallium with aluminum to make the ternary uh, alloy of aluminum, gallium, arsenide. So as I put more and more aluminum in and start with pure stoichiometric gallium arsenide and move towards pure stoichiometric aluminum arsenide, the band gaps, you know, the band structure is such that the, it's, it's a direct band gap gamma to gamma uh, initially. But there's these satellite valleys. And so what ends up happening is that as you dilute the, um, uh, I forget which band it is, whether it's the X or the L, but eventually, this isn't sh telling me, unfortunately, a, figure, a good figure should tell me, Eventually, one of those uh, indirect band gap satellite valleys, this is, they're all going up because this is a, aluminum arsenide is a wider band gap, but it's such that the gamma valley uh, moves uh, at a faster rate with the dilution of aluminum than the indirect band gap valley. And so beyond 40% roughly of aluminum the material becomes indirect. So that puts a limit to how red a red LED can be. If you make it any, um, any uh, push it any farther, um, it'll become indirect band gap and won't work. So here you can see um, this is gallium arsenide phosphide as a similar problem. Um, now, photonics, you know, technically speaking, you may her have heard the term sometimes the area I'm in and my peer faculty um, refer to ourselves sometimes as solid state electronics and photonics. Because we're talking about semiconductors in the solid state. It's kind of bu buzz, uh, buzz speak for, solid, for, for the solid state electronics and so forth. But this is electronics but also photonics because you can, you can think of optoelectronic devices, devices where you put electrons in and get photons out, or you put photons in and get electrons out. Um, and so we also have to kind of think about the optics, the photonics. So if this is having light that emits, remember this is emitting in two pi stradians, all directions. I want to get all the light out. So here it is essentially, here it is, um, um, it's showing a bunch of ray tracing of a few candidate uh, photons that got emitted. And you can see some might go over here, ricochet off the side, go to back down. And so these are absorbed photons. So they're being directed in the wrong direction. They go down and bury themselves in the substrate and get absorbed. And they're, they're basically a tree falling in the forest. No one sees them or hears them. Okay. But if I more cleverly design my LED with these back reflectors, I can get the photons to to ricochet and come back out. So this would be a higher brightness LED. So high brightness LEDs, LEDs that can get more photons out in the direction you need is an important um, um, uh, intellectual property development for the installation of solid state lighting. This is not going to make it as a, as a fluorescent replacement, I can tell you that. Okay. So. Here's another way. This is those nitride LEDs. They actually use a sapphire substrate, which may sound um, expensive uh, because you, maybe you uh, received or gave a sapphire ring to one of your um, significant others. Um, but this is basically aluminum oxide. And so if I have Al2O3, aluminum oxide, and I can grow the gallium nitride 
This is if this is grown and, and it's, it's, uh, has a, it's crystallized, then the uh, gallium nitride has uh, some, there's mismatch and so forth, but it's r roughly lattice matched to be able to grow on an AL203 sapphire substrate. So I can grow my epitaxial layer, my LED. So here I have uh, a, a anode and a cathode. So here's my cathode, my an electrode, my uh, an uh, anode, my P electrode. And then this whole thing is going to glow. Obviously, this will block and shadow the light emission. So then this is how you often see. If you go to Radio Shack and you buy an LED, that's what you're going to see. If you look on, uh, stare at it uh, deeply enough, you'll actually see that this is the semiconductor uh, chip. It's actually bonded down to this lead. So this is electrically connected. It's bonded with a uh, metallic, uh, uh, with a conducting glue. And then they'll do a wire bond where this, uh, from that one, it'll have a little tiny wire. If you squint hardly enough, uh, hard enough, or maybe you look through a jeweler's microscope or something like what, uh, what they look at with di like diamonds and so forth at a jewelry shop, uh, you may be able to see this wire and it connects to the other leads. So I have an anode and a cathode and they actually usually fill this with a plastic epoxy and it keeps the wire from popping off under vibrations. And uh, then they might use a lens or so forth. So that's what you see. And they often will do, this doesn't do a very good job of showing it, but they sometimes uh, build a metal cup around this. So again, any photons going in sort of the wrong direction will have this cup, this reflecting cup, a metallic cup. That's what this is referring to, this reflector. So that any photons that come out the, the wrong way in the LED will be reflected back out. So that's kind of what it looks like. So as you know, you've probably seen LEDs, being able to do segmented LEDs. You, I'm sure you see, been to a sporting event and you see a, a TV screen. It's actually nothing more than a bunch of LEDs that someone soldered in there painstakingly and put in red, green, and blue. And you may not remember, uh, but for a long time, the red, the t uh, those jumbotron screens really had a very poor rendering of blue. And it wasn't until the uh, development of uh, the gallium nitride LEDs that you really had true uh, three primary colors for, for those uh, screens. So if, when you're watching uh, a sporting event on the screen, the Buckeyes or so forth, you can see uh, the blue. So you can see the Michigan Wolverines maybe a little more prominently. The red has always been there, uh, the scarlet. Um, here's the new development. I didn't bring my cell phone with me, but um, some cell phones, like I, I um, maybe I have some regrets, but I have a Motorola Razr, and on the front of the Motorola Razr is a organic light emitting diode display, and it's actually this. So it's actually using molecules like this, star-shaped molecules, if you will, that are deposited onto a glass substrate and they add an anode, indium tin oxide. They use a cathode of a metal. And basically, I have an area where holes congregate and electrons congregate. And this is a plastic semiconductor. semiconductor and they emit. And that's how my um, Motorola Razor light emitting diode, organic light emitting diode display, is uh, presented. And this actually uh, is uh, kind of a very growing field, and you're starting to see even some small TV screens coming out with this. Um, so for smaller displays, it's actually uh, uh, pretty interesting. Here's some slides I got. I borrowed uh, certain visuals. Um, let me bring this dialus back to 85 again. I'll take an educated guess. Nope, you go 80. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it does that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, 75. That seems to work. Okay. 
So these are a few slides that I cherry picked out of an uh, old 835 class. I don't remember what the number is in the new four digit uh, semesters. But here's the idea of black body radi radiation coming out of a sun or a tungsten filament light bulb or so forth. So if you ever heard about warm light and cold light and things like that, this is the terminology. So, so a, uh, uh, you know, certain, certain lights will, uh, uh, you know, there's, this is the black body radiation. So essentially the sun, the surface of the sun, now the interior of the sun's hotter, but what do you see on the surface of the sun is essentially looking like it's 6,000 degrees a Kelvin. And that emits this black body radiation and um, this is actually a better rendering of what the human eyeball sees with its rods and cones. So, you know, they probably heard the biology of that in high school. Um, uh, the one, um, it detects the, uh, the cones detect color, blue, red, and green, and then the rods uh, are detecting black and white. And it turns out, I don't know if you noticed, but towards the center of the retina, is where you have more of the rods, the color rendering rods, and towards the periphery is where you have more cones. So I don't know if you you know, but when it starts to get twilight and really dark out, you're actually seeing more in black and white. It's not only because it's getting darker, but your pupil is dilating and you're seeing more to see, capture more uh, light to be able to see a signal. You're actually using more of the retina uh, periphery of the retina. You know, in hot, uh, bright, bright sun, your pupil's gonna uh, contract and you're only gonna be seeing a small uh, uh, center of your uh, retina. And that's where your color is. But as it opens up, you get more of a black and white image. Um, and um, so, this is the color. You can see it's actually not that beautiful Gaussian I showed. And you can see where the wavelengths cut out. This is the limit of what your human eyeball can see, unless you're genetically modified. Um, and so here is the solar spectrum. You're only seeing a small part of that. By the way, this points out one issue, if you notice. OK, so if I have a yellow uh, light emitting diode, the yellow light emitting diode doesn't have to be as bright as a blue. Because the blue, you can see the attenuation of that is less. So blue comes across as dimmer. So in other words, a blue, uh, blue diode to be equal has to be uh, even brighter in some sense. So it puts a, puts a higher demand on some of the uh, other wavelengths. So these are some photo, uh, photometric definitions, photopic vision. I'm not going to require you to know this for this class. This is, uh, again, these are slides I cherry picked from my 800 level class, but uh, photopic vision, human vision, and ambient daylight, scotopic vision at night, primarily black and white, luminance, luminous uh, intensity represents the light intensity perceived from the human eye from a light source, and it uses the international system called candelas which actually is based on a very, very old concept that a monochromatic light source emitting an optical power of 1 683rd of a watt at 555 nanometers into a solid angle of 1 steradian. Remember, the going in all directions is 2 pi steradian, so this is a very, very small like angle where it would be a photon coming off into a little patch on the whole globe going off in one one stradian um, has uh, a luminous intensity of one candela. And it's based upon a plumber's candle. Might have that in the next slide. Yes. So this is an old plumber's candle when they used to use lead solder pipes, which of course is kind of poisonous. We don't use that anymore. But they would actually melt the lead solder and join water pipes in the 19th century I'm glad we're enlightened now. And this is the candle. And so the brightness of that candle became an international, the basis of the international uh, standards. Yeah, here's the uh, steradians coming off. Um, I'm not sure I quite finished with that slide. Yeah, luminous flux. You can see the light out, po put power. It's like talk about how many lumens you have. That's actually, or candelas uh, is one lumen per steradian. 
Uh, photometric definition a little bit more is that eye sensitivity. That's that curve that goes that I showed you the Roy G. Biv. It's not exactly Gaussian. That's the that's the eye sensitivity function. Uh, and luminous is the ratio of luminous intensity emitted in a certain direction. And the illuminance is the luminous flux per unit area, and so forth. So here's some uh, the, the units they use. And so here's a little bit of eye candy. The colors, basically, if you want to think about Roy G. Biv, infrared is greater than 720. Red is 625 to 720. Amber is here. That's in, that's your yellow stoplight. Uh, you know, on on your on your stop stoplight sign. That's the yellow. Um, here's uh, true yellow, green, cyan. If you want to get uh, detailed, blue, violet, ultraviolet. So your human eye response is between 390 and 720. Edison's first light bulb was a mere 1.4 lumens per watt. Tungsten filament bulb is 15 to 20 lumens per watt. Quartz tungsten halogen lamps. Uh, sometimes we use this, I know in my house, we use it on, under the kitchen cabinets, these little tiny small lights. That tends to be a quartz tungsten halogen. This uh, lecture hall is uh, fluorescent bulbs between 50 and 80. Mercury vapor bulbs, uh, I'm trying to think of where you might see those. Um, uh, high pressure sodium, if you're ever out an outdoor basketball court at night, it's probably these big sodium vapor lights uh, that are used. Uh, yeah, actually, mercury vapor, it might be the ones that they use inside a Schottenstein or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, here's um, how many lux, full moon, one lux, street lighting, 10 lux, home lighting, 20 to 300, office uh, desk lighting up to 1,000, surgery lighting, has to be very bright. They have to see 10,000. Direct uh, lighting is uh, 100,000. So this is chromaticity. We use this, the CIE coordinates, based on 1939. We actually put the um, color into an XY plot, and we tell and we pr provide a certain coordinate on this plot of uh, X and Y. And so the different colors, you probably saw this in a PC, maybe, if you're, or, um, if you're modifying colors on a PowerPoint presentation or so forth, and you really want to select a color that is not one of the, the preferred selections, you'll see this. This is where this comes from. And they essentially, uh, I don't think I have a graph that shows this, but essentially to make uh, a red, green, blue uh, uh, display screen, they will actually go red, green, blue in a triangle. And of course, you add them all together, you get white in the middle. But red, green, blue in, in, a, in a certain triangle. It turns out this dates back so old that um, the light that is emitting, that your TV, your TV transmission signal is based on the, the, the Digital signal that's on a Blu-ray disc, a DVD disc, uh, your digital signal you're getting from your cable TV provider, that video information is encoded with the particular CIE coordinates co uh, equating to a certain red, a certain green, and a certain blue. The only problem is that red, green, blue is actually uh, not a very high quality red, green, blue because Back when color TV was being developed, it was a cathode ray tube. So you had the cathode hitting, spraying electrons, rastering it across the, um, uh, the TV screen, the glass panel. And on that glass panel were little phosphors, the basically uh, glassy-like material that would phosphoresce, not luminous, but phosphoresce. It's, uh, I won't go into that here, um, but the electron would excite, it would phosphoresce, and it turns out this, it's kind of a glassy ceramic material of different compositions that hit the red and the green and blue. Turns out that back then the phosphor qual uh, quality, the phosphor technology was very primitive compared to today. So if you actually look at the, re uh, the red, green, blue CAE coordinates they used, it's actually a very poor red, green, blue. 
Today, we can, we can fine tune things so beautifully that we can actually get a really beautiful red, green, and blue, a really crisp red, green, and blue. The problem is all of Walt Disney and everybody else is all video encoded with the old coordinates and today through legacy we have to follow that convention. So it's kind of sad that we can't like chuck it all and, and clean up our signals. Uh, again, I don't know if you knew that. Um, if you want to do these, uh, to design the CIE coordinates, you basically turn in these XYZs. This is kind of how you do it. I'm not going to go into that. It's not really 330 material, uh, but that's how you do it. Color purity, you may uh, want to know about this, especially if you're a savvy consumer. Okay, so red, green, and blue make cyan, yellow, magenta, white in the middle. So if I replace fluorescent lighting, tungsten filaments, whatever, it was LED lighting, and I put these different color LEDs together to make white light. Depending, on, I can get white light, I can fool you, I can put different white light together and I can play around in that, um, in this, oh, you know what, I need to go this, this might work, if you uh, zoom, Actual size, is that gonna do? There's some way to do full screen. Yeah, is that, it might be. Uh, okay. Um, so I have some region of, of, this is all looking white for the human eye. This is, right, this is mapped onto the human eye response. So I have a degree of freedom to play with white. The thing is, all white is not the same. And so, this is one of the things that you could, um, there was some artwork, for instance, Renoir, I'm sure you've heard of Renoir, one of the French Impressionists. Uh, he had a painting that uh, was displayed in a museum and you can see how kind of washed out this was. And everybody kind of felt that this was, um, oh, the colors have faded, the paint has faded, it's getting old, and that's the best it's gonna get. Turns out they were using uh, bad lighting of uh, the wrong white light c configuration. And if you actually clean up your color rendering, your, your own, this purity, it's actually just as vibrant as the day it was painted. Um, and so you can fool people and change the colors, and mute certain colors and accentuate other colors. And I swear I may be giving away and might be sued after this, but I swear that most uh, supermarkets will use a red, rich uh, color where their meats are being displayed. So the red meat looks much more palatable and pleasant. And you get home and you're like, hmm, it has a little bit of a brownish look to it. So buyer beware. Okay, so here's that down conversion you know, I was talking about phosphorus, so this is an osram uh, phosphor, so you can do different things where you, you excite it and then it emits. So that's kind of what's going about that. I'm going to go back to uh, fit page width. Yeah, that's a little better. Oops. And like here's some of the ways you could do it. Here's that cup. Let me focus down here first. Here's the LED chip glued down in. It's inside this uh, cup. Uh, and here's the bond wires. So here it is magnified. You can see the bond wires coming into the cathode and anode respectively. Light's coming out. And this is the cup that it... Um, uh, but I can make uh, white light many different ways. I could put a blue and a yellow together and fool you. This is a cheap, simple one. I could put a trichromatic white source. I could get really fancy and try and really spread over that whole uh, optical spectrum and do these. I could do these. So you can see how I can put different permutations and put different whites together for different purposes. So again, this is the basic operation. Spontaneous emission, photon, uh, electron comes down, releasing a photon in any two pi steradians. This is absorption, what goes up. And this is the stimulated emission, so you're actually working off of the 
the bands communicating, so recognize that we may not necessarily be at the minimum through the density of states. I may be populated up here uh, as I put my carriers in. Um, question? Yes. Um, is that the same system, the top one? Is that the same? Uh, yes, that was what I was trying to say here is that this is the band, this is a, a blow up of the uh, band structure at the gamma point. This is a direct band gap. And then this is the band, it, it would be a band diagram, which is now usually as a function of X when we're doing our band diagrams and PN junctions and all that. Um, and so in some sense, that's that, that string I'm saying that you cherry pick, that you pluck out of the sweater of the conduction band and valence band. Um, so, this is basically how it is, basic LED, PN junction, that's why we studied it. As you go into forward bias, as you go into forward bias, the electrons are coming across by what mechanism? Diffusion. Diffusion. So the electrons march across, the holes march across, now I got electrons and holes meeting each other, they annihilate each other, releasing photons characteristic of the band gap. But this is uh, messier. I can get a cleaner, more crisp photon energy by corralling the electrons into these quantum wells, which is your 980 pump laser problem. So now I can do this uh, heterojunction in this quantum well, and I can get it very precise. And recognize, I didn't emphasize this uh, much in the computer problem, but now this wide band gap material is a optical window to allow this lower energy photon to go out. So there's no opportunity for self-absorption is the term. So it actually, once it's emitted, it's gonna escape. So again, that boosts my uh, uh, quantum efficiency, my ability to convert an electron to a photon. Um, sorry. Question. Yeah, no problem. Um, so what stops in a normal p injunction for that to be light emission? I mean, uh, it, just seems it doesn't like stop the light emission. But because this photon is of that, let's say, gallium arsenide wavelength, so now it has to go through half a micron or so, and what's on top is also gallium arsenide, also the same band gap. So that photon has a high probability of being reabsorbed by the gallium arsenide materials. All gallium arsenide, then a gallium arsenide photon can easily be reabsorbed by the top layers of gallium arsenide. So That's essentially you're saying there's emission in a normal p injunction. Just there's emission, but it's, it's, again, it's like a tree falling in the forest. It's going to be buried, and no light's going to get all the way out. Yeah. So that, isn't that kind of like a wastage? Is that like wasting the... Exactly. That's the, that's the point. So this is a more energy efficient. So the quantum efficiency goes up. The quantum efficiency is a term we use to talk about the conversion efficiency of an electron to a photon. So if you have 100% quantum efficiency, then I get 100% of photons out of every electron whole pair. And it turns out that here, the internal quantum efficiency is actually 100%, damn near 100%. So um, the external quantum efficiency, what you measure, uh, encapsulates all those losses of the optics, the self-absorption, the shadowing of the, I think it also includes the shadowing of the of the of that metal contact on top and all that. So you look at the uh, external internal quantum efficiency is actually usually 100 percent. The problem is you have this opportunity for self-absorption. So you really do prefer to have a quantum well. So here's the color tuning again. You can hit gallium arsenide substrate and you can go through uh, these different uh, colors. Uh, but you only go up to green, and then you have to shift over to another material system to get, a, get into the blue. Now, the influence recognize that that cut-in voltage, remember the deviations of my ideality, I equals I naught e x q v over k t uh, minus one. 
and the deviations from ideality said that it's actually going this way and then going up exponentially. And so there was that cut in voltage. And that was the point that the um, That was the point that these electrons and these holes, as it went into forward bias, actually started to meet. So it had to go past this voltage here of the barrier. And notice that if I modestly dope this in the position of the Fermi level, this is approximately two-thirds the band gap if these are modestly doped. Um, and uh, so therefore, these dense, the, the carriers that are available start to actually come across. And come, uh, this, this where the most probability of the, the highest probability of these electrons uh, actually starts to really splatter across when you get nearer to the cut-in voltage. That's really what I meant by that cut-in voltage, that deviation from ideality, is these guys actually coming up enough that, that the higher probability point uh, hits this, uh, comes to that point. So you can see that now as a function of band gap, that cut-in voltage will be uh, dependent upon the band gap. So you actually see cut-in voltage here. Uh, that's a germanium diode which is a band gap of 0.7, as you see, silicon, uh, gallium arsenide, um, uh, gallium arsenide phosphide, and here's that uh, INGAN, all the way out of 2.9. So if actually, if you got a, a, a diode from Radio Shack or somewhere, and you actually measured it on a curve tracer, did the current voltage characteristics, if you knew what the cut-in voltage is, you could make a pretty educated, a pretty good educated guess as to what type of semiconductor it is. Now, obviously, that fluctuates a little bit by how it's doped and where the Fermi levels are. But by and large, they're usually doped modestly, and uh, that will be a dead giveaway. Here's the band gap energy then versus um, uh, forward voltage. So you can see that the nitrides, for instance, take much higher voltage. And so that they, um, um, to, to get the blue. So you have, so to get blue requires more energy. And uh, so here's the quantum wells again. This is your 980 pump laser, a wide wa uh, quantum well, very little uh, uh, quantum confinement. Uh, here is a good quantum confinement. And here's the, uh, uh, that's a gas L gas. And here's the density of states, the line width, if you will. This is a little more detail of this, the way it looks, 1.8. And so therefore, that's where the carriers are. They come in and they can escape. And so here's non-ideal resistance. I want a diode that comes in, current goes on, and it actually turns into light. But if I have a leaky diode with a shunt resistance, it can get uh, less, less um, efficient. Uh, this is what I meant about the light output. We talk about Lambertian emission. So light that comes out goes through a uh, reflection at the surface. You've ever put a, a pole, a stick into a, a water, into a pool or a creek or a lake. You see it, it, it had imaginary, uh, in imaginary, uh, it looks like it's bent as it goes through. And so it's basically optical rays bending as you go through the index refraction change. So light escaping from the semiconductor goes through, a, through an index refraction change. So therefore, the light coming out of an LED will actually have a certain output and so Lambertian is actually a true, uh, a tr that, that the light coming out, whether it's normal or oblique, is equally uh, in all angles. That's what this is, that 
This is saying that if I ray trace, let's follow this globe. So that is true Lambertian output. So in other words, if I'm looking at the LED on axis, I see a certain brightness. And as I go off axis, I'm seeing a uh, pretty good brightness. Um, and uh, this one here is baby, basically have a lens. So preferentially, it's more this ellipse. And so it's directing the light more, uh, more towards uh, a certain direction. So that's what you will see in a, in a traffic light. If you look, if the traffic light has been modified to be light emitting diodes, if you're coming from the wrong angle, the stoplight actually look like it's off. And it's not until you get in front of it that you see, because it's trying to be useful, uh, efficient, energy efficient by putting the photons where they need to be. And if you're coming from a side angle, um, from a direction that doesn't, you don't need to see that information yet. You know, so it's attenuating the side globes. By the way, what's the most perfect Lambertian output? Turns out it's the moon. If you ever look at a full moon, you'll notice, if you think about it, because it's actually a globe, you would expect that the center of the moon would be brighter and the periphery of the moon would be dimmer because it's actually pointing away from you. But because of all that moon dust, it scatters the light and a moon is the best example that you probably see with your own eyes of a beautiful Lambertian output. Okay, so you can do all kinds of optical shaping. So here's those, that light. These are three photons going on, go, uh, uh, representative fo uh, photons emitting. They can go in different directions. Uh, here's one that's shaped in this way. And so they can ricochet around. And so only those coming at certain wavelengths will actually escape. Others might be total internal reflection. So here you can shape diodes in such a way. Here's one that actually shaped it into this upside down pyramid. And it actually allows more light by the ray tracing. You can actually get more light to escape. So that's a whole subculture into itself, how to do all that. Uh, you can texture. So this is kind of like putting moon dust on the LED by etching it in something that's going to cause it to become textured like this. And so then if it's flat, it's going to internally reflect. But if I texture it, then, I, then photons coming in bounce ricocheting off that. I have a better chance for escape. So here you can see current spreading. For instance, if I have a conductive layer, if this is not so conductive, the current comes from the top contact and it comes down in this kind of a shower, if you will. And it's only going to go through the quantum well in the middle. So therefore, this is the range that it's going to emit and it's going to be fairly di uh, dim. But if I have a, a layer that's highly conductive, it allows this to spread uh, more effectively and I have a, a larger part of the quantum well uh, participates in the light emission. Or, remember I talk about photons going in the back direction and going into the absorbing substrate? What if I do some, some fancy um, exfoliation and bonding and I put it on a transparent substrate and then I can go from this dim LED to this bright LED simply because I went through this um, substrate transfer technique. This is not easy, but it can be done. Here's reflectors, right? This is kind of a primitive. This may be the first evidence of uh, light guiding. This is before optical fiber communications was developed. This guy had a light box, and he had a bucket of water, and he shined light through the bucket of water to the stream going down to the bucket below, and the water itself coming out of this column ended up being an optical waveguide and the light actually went down the, the water and into the bucket and uh, that was illuminated. It may be the first evidence of light guiding with total internal reflection and that was in 1841. Uh, so you can also do distributed Bragg reflectors and things where 
You get optical interference by high index, uh, refraction, low index, these pairs. And you can actually um, uh, create a filter to, to strategically block certain wavelengths. So if you do high, low, high, low, there's a distributed reflection. And, um, and uh, this um, quarter, it's a quarter wavelength in each of these uh, layers, quarter wavelength. Is, and if you build it in a way that it destructively interferes, you're basically making a bandpass filter. And so you're basically allowing, depending upon how you layer this and the differences in index refraction, that uh, there's a certain region that you get 100% reflection and others where there's no reflection. So here I can actually make a laser that's going, instead of laterally, I can actually make it go vertical. So that was a big innovation. And a lot of that early work uh, was happening around me at Bell Labs in the early 90s was actually some of the, the um, big um, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. If you take a poorer version of that and you do some of those distributed Bragg reflectors, uh, but they're not so, um, the mirror quality is not so high that it turns it into a laser, you can uh, make a, uh, and, uh, you can turn it into an LED, um, and so therefore you're really sending the LED light in one general direction. This actually is one of the ways that they use for plastic optical fiber. So if you're, sometimes this is used inter-office. So the glass fiber I, was, I always talk about is what was used for um, sending a, a transmission signal. I'll come to lasers soon uh, from, say, Boston to London. But this may be from sending from Dries Lab 260 over to uh, the main office, uh, Dries 205. You could actually use a much cheaper plastic fiber over a shorter distance. And instead of using a high-end uh, laser diode, which you're going to see shortly, um, I could use a resonant cavity LED. That's good enough to send them to an optical fiber of maybe 50 or 100 feet. So here's the basis of a, an optical fiber system. I'll have a driver circuit, the laser LED. It goes uh, through the optical fiber to a photo detector. It's amplified. Then the signal is cleaned up by signal um, processing. And here's a better rendering of it. A to D converter, semiconductor laser goes through the optical fiber. It's a bunch of series of ones and zeros. So this is what the um, uh, CBS, NBC, ESPN is sending out. Uh, then it may go to a satellite, or it may go directly to your cable TV provider. Uh, and the cable TV provider sticks it into a coaxial cable and it comes to you. But if you want high bandwidth, like all those channels at once, you may be doing it with an optical fiber, comes into a photodiode. LNA means low noise amplifier, and uh, regenerator and, uh, and digital D, uh, D to A decoder. Here's a little better rendering. You can see how the uh, light optical fiber may be butt coupled, that's the term, I'm sorry to say, but you basically just stick the butt of the, of the optical fiber right onto the uh, either photo detector or, or laser diode. And uh, so all the light coming out of the optical fiber dumps right into that photo diode. In this case, actually, it's a emitter, so it's sending light up into it, actually. Uh, so here's some surface emitting lasers, another rendering of it. Yeah, here's the uh, butt coupling, and so, uh, by the way, you can actually make something called an optical isolator, where, uh, where you can have the input signal, it goes across a small distance in a photodiode, and so therefore this is um, isolated. Some, it's some ways uh, used to, to uh, attenuate an electromagnetic interference, perhaps where I can send it, broadcast it across a small distance through space, and there's no, um, there's no uh, like, you know, electromagnetic sort of uh, coupling and so forth. So it's, it's actually a good way to completely isolate. So it's the input signals attenu uh, is, uh, isolated from the uh, output signal. So here's the laser diode. 
Again, one, uh, two fo uh, photon uh, in, and it triggers the recombination and a photon out. Uh, so here you can see, I'm going to jump past this. And of course, a laser diode, the basic premise of a laser diode is to build a Fabry Perot, this doesn't show it, but Fabry Perot etalon, a Fabry Perot cavity, by having a mirror and a mirror. And it's basically like plucking strings of a, of a guitar or violin that I'm going to have certain frequencies allowed. So the number of wavelengths that bounce back and forth here are uh, an integer number. So uh, the, now this is, uh, so therefore, the wavelengths being emitted will so uh, my LED emits over a Gaussian range, right? Probably localized around the band gap engineering, uh, band gap uh, 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 voltage, and so that translates to a certain preferred wavelength. I put that into a laser cavity. And there's going to be certain wavelengths, integer, that are supported by the geometry of putting it in two mirrors. So when I map the Fabry Pro Etalon, which is just a bunch of integer uh, wavelengths, I and map that onto the emission spectrum of the laser, I'm going to get, in reality, that, that that, 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 and I guess probably that. So I'm actually going to get one, two, three, four, five, six colors. Six different wavelengths will be emitted from that, the way it was drawn. So, oops, I should have gone to the next page. So here's the Fabric Pro Etalon says these are the wavelengths. The uh, LED says it's this Gaussian, so you map it on, those are the laser modes that are allowed. So those are the wavelengths that will um, present themselves. So, going back to PN junction, you forward bias, electrons coming in, holes coming in, they meet in the middle, this is the depleted part of the depletion region, and that's also the recombination zone for light emission. So I'm going to skip past that, yeah, here. So as I uh, lightly bias it, they're sort of hitting. Four bias a little bit more. You get a larger volume, I'm going to get more light output. So what happens is if you can build that Fabry Pro Etalon, those two cavities, the light without a cavity will be just this, broad, diffuse. If I uh, start to turn my laser on, So you see this, and I didn't label my axes, which is a no-no. All engineers just label these axes. This is current versus voltage. Okay. So there's a similar curve to this, not to be confused with this, that is the L, light output, versus I, current in. It turns out that a LED, I mean a laser diode, will sort of have an LED-like operation here, and when that stimulated emission kicks in, it's going to go like that, kind of like our diode. And so at this particular point, it's going to be the threshold current at which lazy takes place. And so that's what's being represented here is that down here, this is spontaneous emission, so I have some representation of this Gaussian profile mapped onto the fabric pro etalon, so I see a bit of a corrugation here, so it'll be sort of, that's the spectral output. But as it um, gets past threshold, it should coalesce into, a, this is a single wavelength or those multiple wavelengths or so forth. So that's beyond threshold, so only certain modes are supported. That's actually what this is trying to show here, is that um, the losses, so a laser needs gain equals losses, is the point, as you pump it and bias it more and more. And so 
this is the losses. So these are actually all lost. And these are the ones above that is what you actually see emitted. So getting towards the end, these are some representations of what those lasers look like. You start with a substrate, grow an epitaxial layer, you fashion it into uh, bars, you cut the bars or cleave the bars. I used to do this at Bell Labs, and then uh, you uh, cleave it the other direction and you stick it into the, uh, that package and you put the wire bonds on and you have your laser diode. And so you can do heterojunctions and things and engineer where it goes. I'm not going to, uh, uh, and so you can see here, uh, again, this is a homo junction, gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide. The, uh, where the optical field is is kind of diffuse, but here I can make um, a semi-quantum well, not really a true quantum well, and so therefore the light is, is uh, rendered in a specific place. So there's, there's what's convolved on here. Let me try to emphasize one thing that's going to come along. I can build a quantum well for the, for the um, corralling or so forth of the electrons and the holes into specific quantum, quantum regions. But it's also acting as where my light emission, I can actually also think of this as the, uh, the optical uh, cavity that is emitting. You'll see, I think you'll see this better in, in a few more uh, slides. OK, this isn't one. But here's an epitaxial layer. And we made this into a laser stripe by basically beating this up by doing an implantation with protons. So we basically destroyed the ability for this to emit light by damaging it. So then I turn into a laser stripe, and this is the laser cavity. This is the mirror. And so when we agonized over crystal crystals, all that crystallography, zinc blend and everything, if I crack, if I cleave, if I, if I, if I like a diamond cutter, right? You ever see a diamond cutter? They, they, they make a little defect and then they snap it. We do this all the time in, in, in our world. And you basically, uh, yeah, we could all go to South Africa and, and work uh, for De Beers, I guess. And so we could s snap this. This mirror, if, done, if, if, if cleaved correctly, is actually a single atomic layer. There's not, it's, it's a single atomic layer smoothness. So it makes a beautiful laser because I'm snapping along the preferred, the weaker crystallographic direction. So if you look at which planes in the crystal are strong or dense, and which are less dense, I cleave it along one of the weak planes, and I can fashion a beautiful mirror. Um, just to be clear, so in this, the recombination is occurring in the depletion region. Yes, I would have a uh, cathode, an anode, or vice versa. The, the current is coming through here, it's meeting in the middle, I guess probably in this one, it would be this gallium arsenide thin layer. So this particular layer, I got a better uh, picture of this. The laser light is going to be coming out of this little rectangle. OK, um, so why isn't there recombination in other parts of the, of the material? Why, why is it just, is it just the depletion region? Or why uh, isn't there recombination? That's the only where the carriers are meeting. So yeah, the electrons come in from the top. And that thin gallium arsenide layer, but it's it, epitaxially, it's actually going in the vertical direction. This is turned on its side. So the electrons come in from the N, the holes come in from the P, they meet in the middle, and that's the emission zone. And then be, um, because this is gallium arsenide and that's aluminum gallium arsenide of a wider band cap, those photons are easy to escape. So then this, I think I have a better picture. Yeah, here. So then here is the way the Fabry Perot, and this is how you spell it. So light emission Fabry Perot here. It's a French, uh, uh, two French scientists. Uh, the light emission is coming out of that gallium arsenic where the, where the PN junction is. And so it's coming out of however wide the laser is made. And this is the mere one. The back face is mirror two. So the light is ricocheting back and forth, back and forth. This is what is the integer number of wavelengths going along this. In our, my Bell Labs days, this was about 500 and, 
no, this was, uh, the, the chip was 512 microns, and this was nominally about 150 microns. So this is kind of rattling around 150 microns to the light, and you're getting one micron light, nominally one micron light out, and it comes out in this rectangle. And I can make um, heterojunction ones, I can make diodes like this, I can get really fancy, I can do multiple epitaxial growth, patterning, regrowth. Uh, so a conventional diode has um, a high threshold current. We want this threshold current to be as small as possible because that means I want to kick in and become a laser with as little energy as possible. So a conventional PN junction is sloppy, it takes a high current. Double heterojunction um, using the Algas gas combinations, I can drop that. And so you can see here at room temperature, I can get that kind of low, uh, just uh, so many milliamps. So you can see it actually gets worse as you make your laser hot. So here's the injection current milliamps, uh, room temperature of a gas algas heterostructure laser. By the way, you can work on these and measure these and do this and actually do a spectral analysis of a laser diode in the photonics lab that we offer, I think, usually every other year. I've taught it twice so far since I've been here. Uh, Professor Anderson sometimes teaches it, and Professor Valco, I think, occasionally has taught that. And so you actually see and, and measure these with your own hands. It's like a two-week lab. Uh, so here, remember those quantum wells? You can do different quantum wells like this, where this is the quantum well for the electron a whole recombination, and then I have this other, this is what I was trying to um, allude to. This, this is for the um, carrier confinement, and this is for the optical confinement. Just like that optical waveguide, do you remember I showed you what the, how that silicon fiber, fiber looks like? So this is acting this is an index or refraction difference. I don't care about it, the electrons. The electrons all splatter to the minimum. This is acting as a waveguide for how the light is emitting and what emission pattern. So remember we were talking about coming off. This is kind of a, a showing you the EK diagram. It's only showing you the right half. But here you can see the different vectors. And here's your gas L gas quantum well. Here's the n equals 1 state, n equals 2 state, n equals 3 state. Those are the, the band offsets. Uh, I am getting towards the end. I'll, tell, I'll let you know. You can get fancy. I can put multiple quantum wells. So each one of those quantum wells, if pumped properly, will emit. So I may be able to get more light out. And this is why, this is why, uh, uh, this is, this is why the laser diodes for optical communications are so ex can be expensive. This is what they have to do to get that. So, right. The diode you can measure in that photonics lab, for instance, is the one that has one, two, three, you know, like six different wavelengths. What I need to do is build a filter. And I don't know if you took any electromagnetics classes or so forth, but by a proper filter, I can basically make a bandpass filter, and I can destructively interfere these, and I can support and allow this particular wavelength to be supported in that mode. And so I destructively and suppress those. And so that's how they do this. They make a laser diode. So this is like into the board. The light's ricocheting back and forth with the mirror, and the light's coming out here. Um, but I have this, I've etched grooves into the vicinity, or I've etched grooves below the laser. So the laser would actually be, the light would be bouncing back. This would be the mirror, this would be the mirror. The light would come out here. So below it, I can build this corrugation. And through that, that's going to act as a filter to suppress Depending upon the dimensions, I can suppress those side lobes and I can get my spectrally pure laser diode single wavelength for the long haul optical fiber communications. So this is called a distributed feedback laser DFB. That's what's used in, in um, 
Uh, here's a vertical cavity sur surface emitting laser. The light's coming off this way with, uh, with a different thing called a distributed Bragg reflector. We talked about that, different indices of refraction. And that is the end, my friends. Um, so thank you for enduring that. That's the uh, basic rudiments of light emitting diodes and laser diodes. Light emitting diodes, obviously, pr pr predominantly for display purposes uh, or intra-office local area networks. Um, and laser diodes, you know, for laser pointers, but predominantly for optical fiber communications and other uh, techniques. Usually, by the way, these types of laser diodes are still not optically pure enough to do things like holography or, or um, things, things like that. It's, uh, the monochromaticity is actually uh, not very good. Um, so you have to go to these big uh, gas lasers and various other uh, versions to do, say, holography and stuff like that. So thank you, and uh, see you in lecture.